last Adam is a life-giving spirit. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Please be seated. You can love your enemies because Jesus is risen from the dead, and so shall you be. Today's lesson from St. Paul illustrates in a profound and beautiful way the manner in which our most basic convictions about Jesus Christ and our most basic convictions about our own hope in Him inform and provide a foundation for the way in which we live in the world now in the present. You can love your enemies because Jesus is risen from the dead and so shall you be. Now in order to tell you about this, I've got my Bible open. We're going to do some old-fashioned Bible preaching, okay? So I'm good. We're, going to, we're going to open up this word. So what you'll need, gentle friends, is to get your leaflet out, and it may help you to follow along in the leaflet with the lesson that's been printed out there. I know this is unusual for Episcopalians. I know you're not used to doing this, actually kind of tracking along with the Bible, but we're going to experiment with it just, you know, just for fun, just for fun, okay? So... This section of the 15th chapter of Corinthians is where Paul gets into the guts of the argument. This is really the, where he puts it all together. It's the culmination of everything he's been trying to say about the resurrection. So he begins with verse 35, but someone will ask, how are the dead raised? Now you have to understand that this is in the, in the, the tone of the Greek here, is that this is a mocking question. This isn't like a factual question like, huh, I wonder how that will happen. It's more like, how is God going to do that? <clears throat> by, it, it, you have to hear it as like, by what possible power or agency could the dead be raised? That's the gist of the question. You, re if you might remember the debate of Jesus with the Sadducees, with those who don't believe in the resurrection. You might remember they tell him a story about there's this woman and she marries seven different brothers and each brother dies in his turn and then ultimately the woman dies. And so in the resurrection, whose wife, which of the brothers' wife will she be? Ha! Gotcha, Jesus! Right? And Jesus says, you know neither the scriptures nor the power of God. Power is what's at stake here. Power is what's at stake in the resurrection. With what kind of power will the dead be raised? With what kind of body will they come? It's kind of like, how are you, you know, how's that going to happen? What kind of body are they going to get? You know, Paul, we don't understand. Paul replies to this straw man that he creates. And you might think that there are some people in Corinth who actually are kind of pitching these questions to him via letter and messenger. He replies in the strongest, most derogatory terms. Tidied up in the NRSV for your reading pleasure. Fool! That's, that's Paul. Fool! How could you possibly think along those lines? What you sow... Now, in your translation, it says, what you sow does not come to life unless it dies. Does not come to life implies that there's some power within it, or some power within us, that, you know, we can have life on our own. And that's kind of out there in the culture, you know, that we have some sort of inner light, that, you know, we just shuck off this mortal body, and that inner light is what's going to shine, and we'll all kind of, we'll flitter around, we'll be spirit, we'll be spiritual people, and we'll flit around and the enlightenment and all that good stuff. Because there's something within us that is immort immortal that we have, that we possess apart from God. You, it, this is written in the passive voice. So we really, wait, and you feel free to, you can have a pen or pencil. Right? So what you sow is not brought to life unless it dies. That's, what, that's, the, literal, that's the literal passive reconstruction. What you sow is not brought to life unless it dies. That is... There is a power outside of it that must bring it to life. It doesn't have some sort of internal motor, like when you turn off a car and then all of a sudden a car can start again. No, it must be brought to life. Who will do that life bringing? Well, of course you know the answer. But God gives it a body. Has he has chosen our life, our eternal life, our resurrection, first of all, what Paul wants the Corinthians to understand is our eternal life, our resurrection, is only a gift of God's grace. 
It's something that God does for us out of love. It is out of love. As Paul was saying, the Jesus who loved me and gave himself for me is the same Jesus who will have the power to bring me to life after I die. So that's the first thing. Resurrection comes as gift. It comes as gift. So whatever life we lead in the resurrection, whatever life we attempt to model as Christians, it must be a life of gift. Okay, let's bracket that. We'll come back to it. And as for what you sow, you do not sow the body that is to be, but a naked seed. A naked seed. So here the idea is that this is some, the kind of life that we have in a resurrection is qualitatively different from the life we have now. In the same way that a stalk of wheat is different from the seed wheat. As, uh, as, Bill, as N.T. Wright, the example that he uses is, we all know that you don't plant cauliflower, and neither do you put cauliflower seed with roast beef as a side. Right? It's different. It's a different thing. The plant and the seed are very different. What is more delectable? The, like, $3.50 honey crisp apple I bought yesterday. I mean, it was delicious, but I can't believe it. Anyway, the, that enormous apple, right? Or apple seeds. Very different. And what is the difference, the qualitative difference between seed and plant with a full grain in the head? One can feed more people, can't it? One is food for others. The other one is potential, but the other one is something that can give life. We'll come back to that. We'll come back to that. Paul goes on. Now, not all flesh. Now, this part is something that the NRSV, or the, I'm sorry, the R RCL, I, I can't remember who I'm mad at from time to time. But the Revised Common Lectionary steals from you an awareness of the next four verses. So I'm just going to have to read them to you because it, it omits this section, which is so important to Paul's argument. So when your text leaves off, and to each kind of seed his own body. Verse 39 picks up. Not all flesh is alike. But there is one flesh for human beings, another for animals, another for birds, another for fish. Why would Paul worry about that? What he's saying is, well, okay, you have human flesh, and you have furry flesh, and you have feathery flesh, and you have scaly flesh. In other words, God is not limited about the kind of flesh stuff he wants to make. He can make all kinds of flesh. So don't Corinthians and... Dallasites to St. Matthew's on a 1030 service, don't in any way constrain God's power and his creativity by what you think human ought to be. He can create whatever he wants. He's, why? And so the animal, bird of the air, fish of the sea, what Paul is doing here, and he'll, he'll do it again, I'll keep on pointing it out, he is pointing back to Genesis chapters 1 and 2 in the creation itself. It says, there is one flesh for human beings, another for animals, another for birds, another for fish. And then he goes on to say, there are both heavenly bodies and earthly bodies. So the sun, the moon, the stars. He's pointing to the whole creation narrative. This is answering the first part of the question. By what power will God raise the dead? Full! Can I get you to stipulate? Can I get you to stipulate on St. Paul's behalf? Of course. That if God made everything, the maker of heaven and earth, I mean, it, 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 basically, if, if you're not a creational monotheist, if you don't believe that God created everything, I'm not talking about evolution all that stuff. I'm just, if God is the source of all life and all material reality, then you're probably in the wrong room. We can find an address for another place you could be, but this is not the room for you. God has made everything. And if God, by his power, has made everything, then who are you to say he can't raise the dead? That's like easy, easy for him. He made everything. And he can remake, renew everything by his power. That's the power by which God will raise the dead. The power of the creation itself. Now, channeled through the person of the risen Jesus in new creation for heaven and for the earth. There are both heavenly bodies and earthly bodies, but the, now in the NRSV it translates it glory. The glory 
of the heavenly is one thing. But doxa, the word Greek word doxa, you're going to get a whole bunch of Greek, and I'm sorry, but, you know, like I said, old time Bible teaching. So doxa in Greek is not just about illumination, but the primary meaning of doxa is more like dignity or status. Okay? Dignity or status. So if I were to read it in the, that sense, there are both heavenly bodies and earthly bodies, but the dignity of the heavenly is one thing, and that of the earthly is another. There is one dignity of the sun, another dignity of the moon, another dignity of the stars. Indeed, star differs from star in dignity. What he's doing here is he's creating a qualitative contrast between the dignity of the earthly, the earthly stuff, and the dignity of the heavenly, which for his audience would be, that'd be just a no-brainer, that the heavenly would have a greater dignity. Why? Because they're closer to God, right? Remember, you know, so the heavenly is closer to God. That's where God lives. So being close to God, they have a greater dignity. Then your text picks up in your leaflet. So it is with the resurrection of the dead. What is sown is perishable. What is raised is imperishable. It is sown in dishonor. It is raised in dignity. Hear that word. Instead of glory, because it ties up with the, the sun, the moon, the stars versus earthly stuff. It is sown... In dishonor, it is raised in dignity. Another way to hear that, it is raised in nobility. It's sown as something in dishonor, but it would be raised to be noble. That's his destiny. It's like, you know, and we have, now, you as Americans, we as Americans, I mean, I'm, I'm one of you, we all want to say, you know, we all have these stories we tell ourselves about, like, you know, the girl who, you know, the suburban girl who wakes up and she's actually... A, a, a descendant of royalty and she's going to be the queen. We love to tell those stories, don't we? You wake up and you're a commoner, but you wake up one morning and you find out that you've been nobility all along. And that's what St. Paul is saying. He's saying the resurrection of Jesus and the gift of the Holy Spirit reveal that humanity, despite all its brokenness, all its selfishness, all its hatred, all its death, is actually noble, is royal in lineage, has a future and a destiny which is of dignity, glory, dignity, that it will be raised up to the right hand of the Father where Jesus himself is seated to welcome us home in that place. It is sown in weakness, it is raised in power, and there's power again. It is raised in power. What kind of power? Specifically, Paul will reveal it directly. Now, it says, it is sown a, in your translation, it is sown a physical body. And it is raised a spiritual body. The way the translation puts it, it's almost like there's a contrast between physical on the one hand and spiritual on the other. That physical is in this stuff, right? Versus spiritual, where we, you know, we'll have like our hearts on the clouds, we'll be spiritual people, you know, blah, blah. No. The, this is one of the things, where actually, the King James Version in the Old English got closer to it. In, in the King James Version, it is a natural body <laughs> versus a spiritual body. Natural meaning earthy, animal body. Versus a spiritual body. The word that Paul uses is a soma psychikos. Psychikos. Psyche is the Greek word for soul. So the Greeks, with the word that, you know, I don't know what you mean by soul, but what the Greeks could mean by soul would be your, either your whole person, everything that you are, including your body, that would be included in a soul, right? We tend to think of it as body and soul as two separate things. For the Greeks, it was like a unified togetherness. But soul was more animal. Like dogs and cats had souls. Horses have souls. Human beings have souls. An animating principle within them. Animating itself comes from the word anima, or soul in Latin. So soulish means natural or animal or of this term. So it is sown a soulish body, 
it is raised a soma. Now, pronounce, you have to pardon me because the Greek is hard for me. I mean, that could be just a thick tongue here. It's a soma pneumaticos. A soma pneumaticos. Pneuma. Spirit. Breath. Okay, so we'll go, go back to Genesis 2. And I, I appreciate you tracking with me. I'm, I'm getting to a point, but you're hanging in there with me. So, Genesis 2, remember from Sunday school, God, what is, how does God create Adam at first? What does he get together first? Dust or earth. Then, what does he do to make Adam? He breathes, he panalmatizes him. He breathes into him and gives him his spirit, his panalma. So there's going to be, there's a soulish body that is a body that has, that has no life without God. And it will be raised a spiritual, a panalma body. Breathe into God's own presence, filled with God's own life. If there is a soulish body, there is also a spiritual body. If there's also a psychicon, psychicos body, there's also a panalma kind of body. Thus it is written, the first man, Adam, became a living being. Quoting, in case you didn't know, he was citing Genesis 2 the whole time. Genesis 2. The first man, Adam, became a living being. The last Adam became a life-giving spirit. Last Adam. It's, this is not as if Jesus is the last in a line. Like, you know, there are lots of Adams, and then Jesus is done with the Adams. It's, the Greek here is ha eschatos Adam. The eschatological Adam. The man who is to be revealed as humanity's perfection, its destiny, its goal, everything we are and everything we hope for has its home and its purpose in the risen Jesus, revealed as the victory of God's love in your life. That is what everything is tending towards. That's what Paul's saying. It is the eschatological Adam, the man who will be there at the end and was there from the beginning. He is the, the loving creator and the loving recreator of a new loving humanity that can begin to live differently. Has not something soulish or earthly or dusty, right? Which is the way it says, the first man in verse 47, the first man was from the earth, a dusty man, is what you, that'd be a literal translate, a man of dust. It's very formal for you because the NRSV was meant to be read by his parents. But it really is saying it, he was a man of a, a, a dusty man. Like, a dusty man. So you have the dusty man or you have something that is filled with life-giving spirit. To have a, to be life-giving spirit means to be filled with God's life-givingness. Not just with God's life, but with God's life giving nest. That is to say that everything it comes in contact with, everything that it knows, it becomes a sharer in that life. It's life giving nest. The eschatological man, the Jesus revealed as the perfect and authentic human, shows humanity to be created, to be life giving. That's our creation. Like an apple versus a seed. Or the full grain of wheat <laughs> versus the kernel. Life-giving. Full of life. Able to be shared. Able to be shared. You are called to be filled with that same life-givingness. You are not given Jesus' life just for yourself to hold as your own private possession. It would die in you like that. That's what being soulish, dusty means. To try to hold on to God's blessings and God's gifts in his life as if they were yours to dispose of. No. You were created from the get-go and are headed towards a life in which you share life, God's life of love and mercy. That's your purpose. That's your end. That's what it means to be filled with life-giving spirit. To have a spiritual body means 
that you become a vessel or instrument of the Holy Spirit, which gave life in the first place. For Paul, in his vision that he imparts to us here, the glory has returned to the temple. Now, for those of you who've been in my Sunday school class, we've been going over this, that, so it all, it's all kind of syncing up here. So, we have to remember that in the prophet Ezekiel, we had a vision of the, the Babylonians destroying Jerusalem, and God's glory, his Shekinah, his presence, leaves the temple. It's kind of like Elvis leaves the building. And he goes away. And, 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 and so then the Jews of Jesus' day, they rebuild the temple, and they're like, okay, here you are, God. We got the temple. It's time for the glory to come back. Any time now, because those Romans are a real bear to live with. Okay? So come on back. And what Paul is saying is that Jesus came to show that the human person is the temple to which the glory of the Lord is returned, just like it dwelt with Adam and Eve before their rebellion. They have the glory of the Lord, the dignity, the nobility of God given to them. And in Jesus and the power of his spirit, you are called to live in that nobility, that glory has come to you and to your life. That's your authenticity, your purpose, and your destiny as revealed in Jesus Messiah. Now, let me calm down a little bit. I'm going to just, and I'll tell you a little story. So when I was in sixth or seventh grade, I can't remember which, I read T.H. White's The Once and Future King. It had a profound effect on me as a boy. And uh, there are parts of it which I, I have, it's not like I go back and read it year after year. I still remember some of those passages. And so basically the Once and Future King is a retelling of the King Arthur tale. And in the very beginning of the book, I think which really resonated with me as a boy, is Merlin takes the boy Arthur and turns him into various animals to, so that he can kind of get the, what are the rules of life, what are the ways to live. And one of the things he turns Arthur into is a fish. And they go down and they find the big fish in the moat. It's like, a, you know, like you think of like a giant, you know, like a toothy big kind of like a, um, oh, like in the north woods, a pipe or something, a northern pipe. And so Arthur goes, and I still remember to this day what a, it made a mark on me. The fish says, power comes from the neck. Meaning, the, the meaning of life is that you have got to be the biggest fish in the moat with the sharpest teeth and the biggest fin to slap your enemies around. That's what true power is. It comes from the neck as a fish, right? And then, after that, Merlin turns Arthur into a goose, like a Canadian goose, and they fly. And Arthur has a goose, as he looks down from 20,000 feet onto beloved England, Albion, right, there, and green. He realizes that he can't make out the boundaries of his father's castle anymore. In fact, all those boundaries and human you know, human divisions, which seem so important when you're walking around as a man of dust, a soulish man. All those things that seem so important fade into insignificance. That none of that matters from the vantage point, point of the goose as he flies over the land. This is a parable of what it means to have the perspective of the resurrection in mind. That in light of the life that we have in Jesus, we can dare, we can have the courage not to get ours back again. We can have the courage not to look out for number one because we know God is doing that for us better than we could ever imagine. Having this perspective of the resurrection life means we don't have to make things fair. And usually, fairness is the rationale, the best rationale, for the use of violence and force we can come up with. Well, things have to be fair. We have to affect justice. And if a few eggs are broken to make the omelet of justice, well, so be it. They have it coming to them. You don't have to make things fair. You don't have to make things come out right and break people to do it. You don't have to do it anymore because from the perspective of the resurrection and eternal life, you can be like giving up, like taking. You can be generous instead of possessive of things or of people. You can give it away. 
You can give yourself away. It makes the epic that we read in today's gospel lesson possible in the first place. Jesus is not speaking in hyperbole in the Sermon on the Mount or the Sermon on the Plain. He is speaking from the perspective of the eschatos, Adam, of the resurrection. When you will get everything that was taken away from you back again. You don't have to make that other guy pay for hurting your feelings. You can ask God's love to be sufficient for you. You don't have to make them give you your due. You receive it from God. Give them even more. Give them beyond what is fair. That's the point of the resurrection life. You are called to be a child of the Most High, to be a brother or a sister of hot eschatos Adam, of the human being revealed in Jesus. When you go forth from this place, I invite you to spend some time in prayer and ask God to show you how you can change your life in light of eternal life. If you think you've got something on somebody, that's a, there's a hint. There's a hint. If you think somebody owes you something, not in terms of contracts or money or anything like that, but they owe you, that's a hint. If you think that you've hurt somebody, that's a hint. If you can't look somebody in the eye, that's a hint. If you can't pick up the phone and call, that's a hint that you need to live in a different light, with a different dignity. You were created as nobility, beloved brothers and sisters. Live as the last Adam or Eve. Amen. <coughs>